Hello and welcome to those of you who are entering uh, this conversation. It's fantastic to have you here with us. We'll just wait for a few moments whilst everybody has an opportunity to get in because we have a large audience this evening. So thanks for your patience while we just wait for everybody to gather. I can see the numbers whizzing up at the bottom of our screen. Welcome again to those just arriving. Hope you can hear. We'll be starting in just a moment when, when everybody's had an opportunity to come in and join us. Thanks for your patience. We've got an amazing audience from all around the country this evening. You see people are still coming in, so we'll just wait one moment. Give it one more second. Okay, I think we're nearly there. So um, I'm going to say uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, happy National Tree Week. My name is Sarah Lom, and I'm CEO of the Tree Council, which is the charity that brings everyone together for the love of trees. Welcome to our truly fantastic arts and culture festival, which tonight is delighted to welcome Cumbrian farmer, shepherd, writer and environmentalist James Rebanks with journalist, broadcaster and author Matthew Stadlin, who's going to be in the chair. So the conversation is going to begin in just a moment, but uh, one item of housekeeping before we begin. If you have any questions, do please pop them in the Q&A box at the bottom and we'll endeavour to answer as many as, as possible of them uh, at the end. So James has had a challenging week this week, planting hedgerows in the snow in Cumbria, supported by the Tree Council and Network Rail with an amazing band of volunteers. So we're especially grateful to him for inviting us into his barn this evening. It's a very lovely barn that he has there. Um, he's an amazing guy, salvaging and cherishing landscapes and finding time to write books as well. And Matthew, our chair, is equally dexterous, juggling his broadcasting commitments with bird watching and photography to create his latest wonderful book, How to See Birds. So thank you, James, uh, and thank you, Matthew, for your fantastic support. And thank you to you, our awesome audience, for joining us this evening. And now it's time to settle back comfortably. I'm going to hand over to Matthew, who's going to guide our conversation tonight. Over to you, Matthew. So thank you so much for having me, for having us. And thank you for such a lovely introduction. I think I've done probably about, I don't know, 80 or 90 of these events this year. And this ranks right at the very top with the one I've been looking forward to most. The only other one, any sort of competition, is with Eddie Jones, who I'm interviewing next week for the How To Academy of England Rugby Coach. Fortunately, we squeaked past France earlier today. But I, I am actually truly honoured to be invited to host this by you guys, because I think the work that you do at the Tree Council is really, really important. And although I know very little about trees, my mum knows much more, I love them and I recognise their importance, their significance and their symbolism, I think, what they represent for us. I said on Twitter quite recently, that trees are humanizing and someone responded by saying that's a very dangerous avenue to go round. are you suggesting that people who don't like trees are somehow less human and of course i wasn't suggesting that that was taking it over literally i just think that, that if we appreciate trees it helps us understand ourselves better and who better to talk to about our landscape and the beauty of english pastoral in particular but James Rebanks, who is a man like Eddie Jones that I've wanted to interview for years now and have never quite had the opportunity to do so. You, you'll know him for having written such brilliant books, including this new book, An English Pastoral. And, and this is about the inheritance that has been left to all of us by farmers and those who've cared for the lands right the way down the centuries. And James's own family have been farming his land quite literally four centuries. He's a storyteller, he's, he's a farmer, he's an environmentalist, he's someone who cares passionately and deeply about the landscapes around him. He's the king of the metaphor, he's probably the king of lyrical writing as well, something I've not been able to do in, in my writing. So James, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for taking time on your Sunday evening 
to join us. Could you just let us know in the first instance where exactly you are? Because it looks like you've got a very posh office. I, uh, yeah, hi. Uh, thank you for those kind words, Matthew. And uh, hi to everybody that's joined us this evening. Um, yeah, I, I'm very lucky. Uh, in the end of my sheep shed, a few years ago, we built a new sheep shed because we, we, we didn't want to use some of the old barns and uh, or, or we changed the use of them. And in one end, we built a classroom. So we have a lot of school visits to the farm. But when the kids aren't here doing sort of educational stuff, I take over the classroom and I have a super big posh office that looks looks uh, amazingly good. But we need to talk about Christmas decorations, Matthew. What what what's going on here? What time? What date of the year do you put your Christmas decorations up? We need to talk about this. This is a very good question, and this is something I talk to my girlfriend about because I'm in a bubble, which has made lockdown two much better than lockdown one. So I'm currently in Kent. And she happens to be someone who cares passionately about Christmas. So I was forced, okay. despite being hugely COVID anxious, not about myself, but about other people, to go and get a Christmas tree in November, James. Oh, my God. I don't know whether I can cope with this. But anyway, who wants to know about my Scrooge instincts? Nobody. <laughs> well, I've been wondering what is to the top right of you as we look at you on your left. Behind you, there's a picture that is either a white-tailed sea eagle or perhaps a Herdwick ram. There's, there's quite a few pictures on the wall of Herbert Rams, uh, some of the best ones that we've read over the years. But there is a picture of a curly up there. I'm not sure. I can't quite tell what you can see uh, from the distance. But um, but sea, sea, sea eagles are amazing. I went to some Norwegian islands last year and um, got to see them up close over a few days. They're amazing, right? Amazing They're birds. incredible. In fact, one of my brief experiences of, of the beautiful part of the world that you live in, the lakes, was when I drove from London via my parents' place in Mid Wales, which is similarly astonishingly beautiful, right up to the island of Mull. I think I landed in my car on Oban and then took the ferry across. And I went and joined up with this boat called Mull Charters. And it's run by this amazing guy who's developed a relationship with the eagles. So he feeds them through the year. And I jumped on the boat and then took my big Nikon lens with me and was able to photograph these quite remarkable birds from incredibly close up. And their wingspans are even bigger than the golden eagles. I mean, they're, they're, they're some of them quite comfortably over two meters. And they're also just beautiful birds to look at with the white heads and the, and the white tails. I was, I was talking to the place I was at in Norway, uh, which is halfway up Norway in Vega. Um, uh, it's funny because you watch them and they're, they're a bit like lions, right? They hang out the whole time, sort of big and, and lazy and they're just waiting for the geese to switch off. And then the, their thing is like a lion. It's like sort of stealthily get over the headland, arriving among the geese, and then all hell breaks loose. Uh, and then they, they, they get full and then they just sit there for the next 24 hours until everybody stops being scared of them again. And then they try and repeat it. But it was amazing that the Norwegian fishermen were telling me that sometimes they kill golden eagles. If the golden eagles are unwise enough to get close, they, uh, one of the fishermen, said he'd seen one uh, grab uh, by a sea eagle and sort of tossed, tossed down, just sort of crunched in its talons. I don't know if that's true, but that's what he said. Well, I was always obsessed with tests of strength when I was a boy. I always wanted to know whether my dad could beat up anyone in, to protect me. I wanted to know who would win, a bull or a lion. And so when I discovered that a goshawk, which is the only English or British bird of prey that I've yet to see, I think there's 16 maybe, I've seen 15, that I discovered that the goshawk could actually take an adult buzzard. I was seriously impressed. They're incredibly strong birds, not necessarily particularly big. Like the male goshawk is not much bigger than the female sparrowhawk, if at all, but they've got unbelievable power. But, yeah, that's, it is amazing. Although buzzards are the biggest wimps ever, right? They're just <laughs> such wimps. They, they look like they're proper sort of uh, look at me big, but they're, they're feeble, aren't they? They're, they're pretty feeble. They're more like a sort of... Um, I know they do catch live prey and rabbits and things, but the ones here spend a lot of their time, they're sort of scavengers or they're eating smaller stuff, aren't they? They're, they're eating beetles and worms and little frogs and things. Yeah, um, yeah. their size their size slightly gives you the impression that they're gonna be big sort of kick-ass things, but they're, they're quite timid really, right? But it's so important to have iconic species. So the golden eagle, for example, or the white-tailed sea eagle, and in your case, perhaps in, in the Lake Street, I don't think you have golden eagles anymore. You did have a pair, or maybe just one, that was there for a very long time and finally died. 
but you have got your own form of iconic species in the in in, in the sense that the the, the Herdwick rams that you told me how to pronounce correctly while we were in the green room, they are great, beautiful, big big sheep, aren't they? I mean, they're they're an iconic species in and of, of their own, and that's important for you because as well as being a farmer and a storyteller and a narrator, we'll, we'll talk about all that as well later, but you've also done work for the World Bank, you've done work for UNESCO, and you, you want to attract tourism to beauty spots, but to do so in the right and responsible way. Uh, sort of yes and no, forgive me for this. Um, so, uh, so the UNESCO work isn't really about attracting more people, it's, it's about making sure you protect the place when they come, or to think carefully about what, they're gonna, what impacts they're going to have on the place. Um, so yeah, I've been really lucky. I've worked all around the world through that kind of work. Uh, I do less of it now. I still do a little bit. I'm doing some work at the moment in Barbados about the, uh, the sugar and rum slave economy. And they're starting to, that story that we're all sort of following, like the chucking of the statue into the bay in Bristol. Um, sort of Barbados, Barbados has this tourism economy, which is really about um, uh, seaside, posh hotels, sunshine, palm trees. Uh, and almost none of it's about the real history of Barbados. So there's a really interesting project happening there that I'm slightly involved with, uh, where, where they're trying to think about how they could tell that story. And it raises all sorts of difficult issues, like the people on the current tourism, do they want to think about slavery? Um, how would you tell that story? And it was interesting, one of, the, one, of the, uh, one of the people from Barbados that I'm working with the other day got quite cross with one of their colleagues and said, look, the whole world's talking about slavery and race. And it's absurd that we wouldn't tell that story in a place where it had some of its worst effects. So, yeah, this this has taken it got off on a tangent, but yeah, I've I've had another I've had another working life that's taken me got me to do all sorts of interesting things, and I'm still very very lucky that I can juggle my writing and those other things with living in this place and looking after it. And and yeah, to bring it back to the Herdwicks, the Herdwick sheep are yeah, they're, they're probably my. I was going to say they're my number one thing or my sort of uh, my real passion, but that I don't think I have a number one thing. I have three or four things that I love in my life, and they're one of them. Uh, so yeah, we try we try to breed a really good flock of herdic sheep, and and yeah, and that that just makes life interesting because I'm part of that culture, I'm part of that heritage, part of that tradition, and yet um, yeah, and, and yet there's legitimate questions asked about the uplands and how much nature or how many trees are in the uplands. So I've, I've got to I've got to think that through, just like anybody else that lives on these farms, like me, and and work out how you square that circle, or if it's possible to square it. I think you've said already that, that if you only had three days left on this earth, you'd spend some of that time inspecting Herdwick rams. I don't know whether you said that tongue in cheek or not. <laughs> no, that 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 yeah, that I mean, the autumn when we're selling and inspecting and doing other things with the rams, that's I, I absolutely love that. That's that's. Yeah, one of my favourite things. And, and there's not much to not like, really. Even if you're not a sheep person, you're in the most beautiful valleys in England. You're with these fantastically oldie worldy farming people on little farms up lanes in the middle of nowhere. The setting's amazing. Um, yeah, and if you're, if you're a writer like I am, it's, it's just gold dust. Everything that comes out of those people's mouths is, should be written down immediately and put in a poem or one of my books, maybe, in the future. So, um. Yeah, I love that. And I, I love the breed itself. I love, I care deeply about traditional farming. I think it has a really important role to play that isn't very well understood by many people. And yeah, I, and I'm proud of what I'm from, really. I'm, I'm proud of my valley, both, it, both its history and what it is now, because it's changing and it has a lot of different people in it, but that's, that's good. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm proud of where I'm from. And I just want it to I want the place I'm from and the community I'm from to put its best foot forward, to, to, do, to be responsible, to listen to what it needs to listen to, to, to change how it wants to change. And, uh, and yeah, just, yeah, I love it. And I want, to, I want to defend it. I want to tell people how great it is. And I can do that better if we're, if we're being sensible and progressive and looking after the place properly. So just to develop this theme of the relationship that you and we as, as a culture have with the land, I mean, in that work that you, you've, you've done for other organizations, you've, you've been to China, I think. I don't know whether you've actually been to Barbados yet, maybe not in the pandemic, but you've been to- Just by people. Zoom. Yeah, by Zoom, yeah. it's not quite the same thing. <laughs> no, so uh, I've, I've worked in, yeah, I've, I've worked all over the place. I've worked in Mexico, I've worked in Tanzania, 
I've worked in South Africa. I've worked in Malawi. Malawi is probably my favorite favorite place outside Britain. I've worked in some awesome places, and it's, and, and you, yeah, you it's work, been good. You work with the Maasai, haven't you, in the Maasai Mara? Uh, yeah, briefly uh, in Tanzania in the uh, Ngoro, I can't say it, the Ngoro, Ngoro crater in Tanzania, um, which is not that far away from Mount Kilimanjaro. And yeah, I had a series of meetings with the Maasai and then went to their villages. And yeah, that that was that. And I still I still keep in touch with some of the Maasai pastoralist people that I I met then. So uh, yeah, some of them are my friends. So yeah, I very much enjoyed that. I think they showed respect for you once they heard that your background as a pastoral man, as a man of the land, as someone who farms his own, who's farmed his own acres. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, the the truth is that UNESCO works. Sometimes they drop you into these really tense situations, and they basically did there. Uh, so on the on one side of the room were the Maasai, and they all looked really fed up and grumpy and slightly cross. And then on the other side of the room were the national park people, who also looked fed up and cross. And there's basically, as there is in many places, there was a sort of, um, what, how would you describe it as? A sort of d division or sort of culture war between those two groups of people where they just didn't see the, see the world in the same way. And it, I have to say, it wasn't a particularly successful uh, piece of work I was involved in. It stopped quite soon afterwards, but uh, I was brought in to try and get that conversation to work a little bit better. And yeah, the Maasai didn't want to be there and didn't trust anybody from authority. They'd had a, sort of bad experiences. And uh, yeah, I, I cheated basically. I, took, I was listening to them and what they were talking about and what their lives were about. And then I told them about my life at home, which, which until a year or two before I'd been keeping secret on those trips, trying to pretend that I was a professional and I didn't have a farm and that wasn't who I was. Uh, and yeah, the, it, the mood completely changed. The Maasai all started talking to each other and then they started smiling. And then when we stopped for a coffee break, I was uh, deluged with all these fantastic Maasai people in their costumes, uh, all gathering round. And the one that could speak English the best, the lady, um, she said, we think we can trust you because you have uh, cattle and sheep. And we, we want to take you to our village and explain this from our point of view. And um, so, yeah, I had an amazing few days uh, with them. And I didn't, the truth is, I didn't, sol I didn't solve all the issues that were in that place. There was some structural stuff that wasn't good. And, that project took a different turn that didn't involve me after a while but um yeah it was uh, yeah it was amazing to see well, I have oh, by, by, yeah but by the way that that was fascinating because maasai culture uh, says that being a pastoralist is the highest thing you can be culturally there's nothing above it and uh there's a whole safari tourism thing happening in tanzania but the maasai barely benefit from it and when you actually go and talk to the maasai their idea of being subservient or having a, a shit life is uh, serving somebody else or cleaning somebody else's bedroom or working as a waiter or waitress. That's beneath their sense of themselves as a pastoralist. So they never, they never take the jobs that are available in tourism, which was and the only jobs they would take. And I love this because I met a lady who was a conservationist and she was an expert on uh, lions. And she persuaded the Maasai that instead of proving you're brave as a young man by killing a lion, which is what they did 20, 30 years ago, or I hope that long ago and haven't done it since. Uh, she persuaded them that taking researchers as close as possible to lions to study them was equally as brave. And she was hiring them to do that. And they'd, she, she'd found a way of flipping their sort of traditional mindset about lions on its head. And they were working with her. And uh, that was amazing to see. I've seen amazing conservationists all around the world who, who found ways to flip, sort of flip traditional cultures to make progressive things happen because all too often it goes the other way. You, you sort of butt heads and then it goes worse instead of better. Well, uh, the, the Plato had the, the philosopher kings and the Maasai, it seems, put pastoralists as, as the, the, very, the, the, the very acme of society. But when I was on my honeymoon in, my, in, my former, in, a, for, in a former marriage, I don't know how you refer to a past marriage, we were, we were hanging out in, the, in just on the fringes of the Maasai Mara and I was, I was absolutely convinced that our tent we were in the honeymoon suite, and it was at the, it was at the at the perimeter of the of the camp. So it was isolated. There was no fencing around. We were in the middle of lion territory. I was convinced that lions were surrounding us in the middle of the night. It turned out that it was actually a hundred wildebeest. But I confused the noise that the wildebeest made with the noise that the lion made. So we were told in advance that the walkie-talkies we were given were only to be used in an emergency and they'd only ever been used once by a drunk Frenchman who'd got lucky with a 
a lady and wanted an extra bottle of wine. But on our first night, I couldn't resist using the walkie talkie because I thought we were going to be eaten alive by lions. And these Maasai guys, they come out in the dead of night in a storm, being told that, that you're being surrounded by lions. And all they have to protect themselves is a mini club and a little dagger that they keep in their sheets. I mean, these guys are the bravest of the brave. I, 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 um, I spent an afternoon, I finished early on this mad thing that they asked me to do. And I spent an afternoon, I went to the Maasai village and I walked with some of the men that were herding the cattle. And they're literally walking across the hillside and there's a, a pride of lions like 300 meters away over there. And they walk the cattle past with a spear. Now, I know there's loads of sort of pastoralist wildlife tensions and issues. And that's partly what I was there to, to learn about. But yeah, they've got like a little spear and the man's wife's walking with him with the cattle. And you're thinking, wow, this, this could go bad, really badly wrong, but they know what they're doing. Now, James, we want to bring you back to the English landscape. The reason I brought the Maasai into it is because I wanted to talk about the relationship that people who manage their land have with their landscape, but also with others. So tell us about what you're trying to do as a, a farmer of a relatively small area of land, how you're trying to be true to your values and how that then can impact if it's done at scale across the country. Okay, so... Um... So the truth is, uh, as I began to learn about sort of more about ecology, uh, and we were always quite a family that thought they cared about nature, to be perfectly honest. My grandfather cared about barn owls and was quite traditional in that sense, and quite romantic about the wildlife on our farm. But I think I realized about 20, 25 years ago, we didn't actually know very much in a technical sense uh, sort of about the ecology of this place. So I've been mean, trying to, the first bit was probably learning more. So maybe 15 years ago, started having people like the local Rivers Trust, Eden Rivers Trust came here and uh, would spend a bit of time with me sort of talking through how we could make it better. And we were talking, we were looking for, the, you know, I, I needed certain things as a farmer. I needed new fencing. I needed to divide fields in certain ways. And they, they were pretty smart in that they, they, they came to talk to me and they said, okay, well, we'll help you with that, but you've got to give us the riverbank. You've got to give us these areas to do something else in them. Um, and yeah, to, to race forward with that. The more I've learned, the more I've got interested in things like rewilding. I've got interested in woodland. I'm interested in grazing ecology. And I'm trying to work out, okay, what was this place before, before we changed it so severely? What was it like? And as I write about in the book, um, my new book, uh, it's pretty clear. Uh, there's some debate about to what extent different things existed at different times, but it's pretty clear that it was a, a sort of wooded, it's wooded stroke savanna type landscape that you, uh, so if you leave it now, what does it become? It becomes temperate rainforest. Uh, but if you go back before there are many people here, it looks like there's large herds of herbivores um, changing it as well, giving it a kind of dynamism. So there's clearings, there's thorny scrub, there's willowy scrub, there's ponds, uh, there's sort of wetlands and wild rivers. There's quite a lot of grazing and disturbance going on in it with things like wild boar. And there's quite a lot of woodland. So uh, the more I learn about that, I'm thinking, okay, how, how could I keep making a business here? How could I live here, pay my bills? How could I keep some of my traditions going that I care about? Um, and how could I create some of that in this landscape? And that's, that's become something I'm really, really into. So yes, I've, I've already spoken about how much I love my herd of sheep, but I can do that in a patchwork landscape. I can, I can create wildlife corridors down every one of my streams and rivers. I can, I can take the wettest, boggiest bits of my farm and I can create really good wetlands there if people will help me. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not rich. I, I, I don't have endless amounts of money in the farm, but if charities or environmental schemes can help me, I can create fantastic wetland. So uh, initially I said no to changing the course of rivers on our land. I was like lots of farmers. I thought that sounded mad. Um, and then in the last two or three years, we've done that as well. We've started re-wiggling all of the rivers through, uh, through the farm, admittedly small, streams, becks, but it's done a lot of good. And then we're trying to get trees, absolutely lashings of trees. So thank you to the tree council who've been helping us recently, um, as Sarah said at the start of this. So we sort of work with anybody that will help us to, to move along this journey. So we work with a charity called Another Way, a fantastic local charity that do have a plastic free shop in Penrith and do all sorts of brilliant stuff. Uh, and we work with uh, another charity called the Ullswater Catchment, sorry, Ullswater CIC, which is a community interest company. And all of these fantastic people, botanists, 
experts on moths, bats, birds, whatever it is. If somebody wants to work with me and they've got an idea for how I can make it better and we can find some money, we'll do it. So we're trying to get as many trees as we possibly can into the farm. I think we've put something like 10,000 in so far, 10 or 12,000. And I think we've got another 10,000 to go in this year. We're, we're trying to create a patchwork of little fields surrounded by fantastic bushy hedgerows, uh, as much woodland as we can fit in around the edges. And then, bear with me, then the, probably the biggest innovation of the last five years has been learning to graze in a way that mimic, mimics nature better. So uh, by, by using all those new hedgerows or old hedgerows restored, we've got a patchwork now of something like 45 different fields. Um, and we're trying to do what some of the American regenerative farmers are doing, which is in the gro peak growing season, try and extend the period when we're not grazing. Uh, and so we used to think it was good if we gave a field two or three weeks rest. And that enables your, your grass to maybe go this long and you think you're doing great as a farmer. So what we're trying to do now is to give it not two weeks rest, but sometimes give it two months rest or even three months or maybe three and a half months. So we've got up to like 90 days in summer now where we give some of our, all of our fields either two 45 day rests or one 90 day rest. And the, the transformation in terms of wildflowers and grasses and plants um, and just the sheer amount of biomass that leads to a massive amount of insects and birds is staggering. And then, What's been great about that is that that's really rapidly changing our soil. So we've raised the organic matter in our soils uh, in three years, we raised them by 2%, which is incredible. We've changed the color of our soil in loads of our pastures just by doing that. So bear with me. So when we do graze after those long periods where the plants and flowers have had a chance to do what they would have done in nature, we graze more heavily uh, with more mobbed up larger flocks and herds and then they make a real mess. They trample it down. They trample a lot of carbon on the surface. They, they pee, they muck, they leave saliva everywhere, but they're always gone within three days. We try and move out the field within three days, sometimes in one day. Um, and that's, that's sort of like when a herd of bison or a herd of wildebeest or buffalo turn up in a place, they trash it, they knock it all back down, which is great for grassland. It's part of the process. And then they move on. And so that's what, it's, it's a whole mix of things. And, the really amazing thing is now when you walk around our farm in summer, I used to think it was a farm that was good for nature and it was pretty good compared to most English farmland before we started, but it's, it's off the chart now. The, the sheer number of birds that take off from the fields and everything, amazing. What are the logistics, James, of planting 10,000 trees? Uh, that's a good question. So uh, I was slightly oversold by Sarah at the start of this when she introduced me. So I can't plant 10,000 trees in a year. I can't do that myself. There just isn't enough time. And then I'm doing things like this and, and I'm busy with the farm. So we've had an amazing number of people help us. So the charities I mentioned before, Another Way and also to CIC, the Woodland Trust have helped us. Loads of volunteers are helping them and helping us. So even though it's been like three or four inches of snow here this week, We've still got, I'm not sure of the numbers, something like 3,000 trees in this week and more to go in on our land. Um, so, so it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people giving up time and helping, helping to make good things happen on our land. ITV were filming you, I think, this week. I saw a little package of you, of you planting trees in, in the snow. And at the last election, the main party seemed to be competing to see who would promise who would pledge in their manifestos to plant the most trees. So thankfully it's very in vogue. Here's a question though for you. So as you said in, in one of your earlier answers, your last but one, the landscape, if it had been left entirely alone, might be temperate rainforest. You go to swathes of the, the, the Eastern seaboard of the United States, if you go to Maine, they're just the most enormous number of trees. And someone who's been brought up in the English and Welsh landscape, I'm not familiar with. There is something beautiful about man's interaction with nature. So if I think of the, the sheep farms in the hills of, of mid Wales, where I grew up in the holiday time, or I think of the lakes where you are, there is something wonderful about man's impact on nature. Now that's not always the case, it can be disastrous. Can we get a happy balance between preserving some of the beauty of our landscape where trees aren't dominant, but at the same time introducing many more trees just as you are? I, I think we can get a balance. And I think you just have to acknowledge up front, is it going to be as perfect as it would be if we all disappeared out of it? And I mean, not just me, like everybody disappears out of the North of England. 
and you could have something approximating to a wild ecosystem, it's not going to be that good. Uh, can we make it massively better than it is now? Almost certainly. So I, I think one of the things that gets lost in a lot of the media is how varied the uplands are. So um, there's bits, there's bits of the uplands. There's a bit I live in from here to Glen Ridding that's fantastic. It's full of wood pasture. It's full of uh, gills that are recovering naturally because the grazing has been changed. It's full of uh, large areas where people have planted broadleaf woodland. So it's there's some good stuff. And then there's I, I know it's, they call it a sort of wet. What do they call it? A wet desert, don't they? There's huge areas of the Scottish Highlands. Not great. I can't pretend I'm. I think that's perfect. Uh, the Pennines look very bare to me, much better than where I live and how it works. So, so what does the balance look like? Um, there was a fantastic thread by, on Twitter about this about a year ago by my, for, by my friend Lee Schofield, who works for the RSPB. And he did this thing, which I, I really I think is good. He was showing what our landscapes look like in the 18th century when the artists came and first painted them and what they look like now. And what was interesting in the Lake District, it's not true everywhere, but in this part of the Lake District, was that they look quite similar. The actual amount of tree cover wasn't massively different, uh, but what looked like was missing. There were certain things missing between the photographs, and one of them was the uh, sort of scrubbiness on the lower fell sides. That looks like it's disappeared, and presumably that was because it was more cattle on the lower fell sides, and then it got to be sheep, and it was too many sheep for too long in the same place. Um, and then there were other things. Uh, there were other things there that were missing, like the the lake shores in those early paintings are full of reed beds, and then you look at them now, and they're not. There's now a hotel there or the roads there or something. There's all sorts of, so there are some missing bits. So how do we, how do we put it back? I think, I think working out how to get as many, tr many of the right kind of trees in the right places on those fells is one of the key challenges. Because I, I suppose I just wanted you to take this bit of the question head on as well. What I'm, what I'm saying is that, is it possible that actually man can sometimes in some circumstances through farming methods, if done well, can actually improve a landscape because if the whole of England and Wales were largely covered with trees and this is not to say that I don't want many more trees than we already have of course I do and far too many trees have been cut down and deciduous woods have probably been replaced by coniferous woods for financial mot motives but what I'm suggesting is that actually when farming is done well by people like yourself or the people who husband the land in mid Wales that I know so well that can actually be a rather a beautiful coming together of man and nature. I, I think you could argue that, but if you're going to argue that, you better have a, you better make your landscape that you're from or you're you're managing a dam site better than it usually is now would probably be my answer. So, uh, can I argue that I my family have been perfect stewards of this land? I, I don't think I can. I could I could spin you a romantic tale about how wonderful it is, and there is lots of good in it, but I can't I can't ignore. What the ecologists are telling me which is that there's there's too little woodland in this valley there's too little sort of uh, natural wetlands and things so i i think if we're going to make that argument and i do love lots of the beauty of the traditional farmlands in in some parts of the lake district i think it's beautiful um but i i think we have to do it more than that i think we have to listen to the ecologists about what there's too little of and so, and i think i think we can do that i think we can take the traditional farming and we can rein it in a little bit, we can tweak it a little bit, we can, we can stop the more damaging things it does. And the, the most damaging thing it does is set stocking, which is, for anyone that doesn't know about grazing, uh, grazing itself is not actually an unnatural or damaging thing. It's damaging when you leave the animals in the same place for too long, so particularly if it's one kind of animal. And over a long period of time, they can clear forests, they can clear all sorts of things, because there's no regrowth. So on our farm we're not doing away with grazing we're just putting grazing back into a system that nature can cope with much better and and the truth is if you want woodlands to regenerate you wouldn't put large numbers of my sheep into them you'd you'd probably have a distance system like that described by benedict mcdonald in his book rebirding you'd probably have more upland more of the uplands would have extensive cattle grazing in them because cattle are fussier grazers and more stuff would happen i want to talk about rewilding and lots else but just quick fire a couple of questions as said everyone watching and listening gets a, a, a clearer understanding of exactly where you've come from if they haven't read your book. So how many acres do you have? We have, we own 100, as a family, we own 185 acres and then we farm another 100 acres of other people's on sort of seasonal grazing arrangements. And then we have the rights to take a flock of sheep to the mountain. 
And is it six generations of the Rebanks family that have farmed the land? Uh, it's slightly more complicated than that. So uh, our family tree in, this, in the next parish goes back 600 years until you run out of paperwork. So we think they were there for much longer than that. But we've only been on this particular parcel of land since 1964. So uh, before, before that, we were on different pieces of land in the same parishes. If I was to say to you, we'll give you a lot of money entirely to rewild your hundreds of acres, the, com yep. the combined area that your family over the last 600 years has farmed and the, and, and the, yep. the, the land that you've accrued. And I said, okay, we'll give you loads of money and, and, and you can just give it over to rewilding entirely. So it would cease to be a farm. So it would be somewhere perhaps that you could reintroduce wild animals, you could re reintroduce golden eagles and so forth, we talked about at the beginning. Would you say yes to that? And I don't mean from a personal financial point of view. I mean, in terms of trying to get the balance right as a society between our farming needs and the needs yeah. to try to, 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 to curate a landscape that can, that can offer us nostalgia and links to the past. Okay, I, I'd, uh, sorry to be troublesome, I'd ask you what you meant by rewilding and I'd need to understand the logic by which that was a good thing. So, uh, uh, so what, I've been to NEP, if we take NEP as an example, I go to NEP and I don't see a landscape that's not farmed anymore, I see a landscape that's farmed in a very extensive way. Uh, when I met Charlie Burrell, I, I know Charlie and Isabella, because um, I went to meet them and uh, what Charlie said to me I manage this place with a gun and then he chuckled and he said this is not unmanaged this is just managed in a way for nature so uh, if it, it all depends on what your definition is really if you want to pack this landscape this valley the next valley and the whole of the Lake District with nature uh, I'm in I'm in come and talk to me about what my role in that is if you want me to abandon my land uh, then you have to persuade me that's a good thing, not just not just a good thing for me. You have to persuade me that intellectually that stacks up. That so I saw some amazing uh, stats from the Sustainable Food Trust today, which said, which basically showed that because uh, uh, British farming is relatively intensive and, and productive, uh, for every acre of British farmland you take out of production, you'd have to have two acres of the Amazon rainforest in beef production to make up the meat that's lost. So another way of looking at many of our less than perfect landscapes is that they're feeding people that don't have to be fed by better landscapes elsewhere. Now, that, that's not an excuse for keeping it rubbish, um, but I, I don't buy the landscape. Or, uh, sorry, I don't buy remotely. I don't think it makes sense. The logic of abandoning the British uplands. I don't believe it's remotely possible anyway. Uh, so I don't buy that. I think I think we need to talk about this differently, which is how do you take a landscape like the one I live in that has 42,000 residents, that has 19 million visitors a year, which is every little bit of it is carved apart by footpath, footpaths, uh, dual carriageways, main roads, little roads. That's, it's hard to imagine how that could be any kind of genuine wild uh, in any sense that worked in the past. So the question to me is, all right, we can't change most of that, but what can we do it as the humans living in it to put as much good stuff in it as possible? Okay, so one of your neighbours, I think, it was a real traditionalist and, and used to, to farm his land much in the way it had been farmed for, for decades, if not centuries, perhaps centuries. Then others of your neighbours were going very, very modern. Philip Limbury is the CEO of Compassion and World Farming. We'll come, into, to, we'll come on to the question of meat eating, I think, and how that relates to farming in a moment. But one of the things that he keeps reminding us, and I think he's a brilliant advocate for... for for change in the way we do farming, is that there is only something like 60 or 70 harvests left. Now you've already talked about the importance of rotating your fields so that the soil is preserved. You touched on this earlier in one of your answers, but is it unrealistic, even with subsidies, to turn the clock back on modern farming? I'm not for the moment talking about battery farms, but the way that land is pumped and exploited for everything that it can be. Can we go backwards sure. in a sustainable way that, that can allow farmers to continue to make a living? Uh, so, well, technically, technically, yes, I can, but do you, want, do you want us to feed the 10 billion people that we're heading to? 
you can't you can't do both can you you can't go back to 1940s level of food production and feed 10 billion people you can't even feed 7 billion people and we we know that the haber bosch process from 1909 that fixes nitrogen out of the atmosphere and enables you to put it into with fossil fuels grow plants that that's feeding like half of the people in the world something like half the people in the world it's probably made half the calories that made your body and my body so how much can we go back not very much to anything sort of purely like the past and i don't think we should be trying to do that anyway can we go can we create landscapes that produce quite a lot of food that do it largely using sort of semi-natural processes those chemical, the sort of real nasties out, the really nasty chemicals, the really nasty, I don't like synthetic fertilizer, get that out, um, and still produce a lot of food, food. Yes, we can. So we now know stuff about, to give you an example, we now know stuff about um, managing soil through managing grazing, which can raise the productivity of our grasslands by something like 30%. So the way that I graze now is not only better for insects and birds, it's something like 25, 30% more productive over the year because of a change of technique than it was before. It's, I, I believe on our land, it's more productive than when we use synthetic fertilizers. So it's not going back to the past, but it is going, it, it is, it, it's taking elements of the past and retweaking them with new science, new techniques to, to feed a lot of people and to look after a landscape. One of the things that you managed to do in your writing is you managed to describe the nitty gritty, the toughness of being a farmer. I remember hosting events at the Hay Festival when we were allowed to host events on stage pre-pandemic and I always used to go up into the hills and on one occasion I met one of the farmers and I mean he conveyed to me so quickly and so clearly how incredibly tough it is to be a farmer I mean I don't think he had a day's holiday in the entire year because he just couldn't leave his sheep he couldn't leave his cows and so forth you managed to convey this sense of the almost brut brutal reality of being a farmer but at the same time you're able to step aside from that and appreciate the astonishing beauty of your of your landscape. Tell us a little bit in your own words now about how much you get from your surroundings. Um, I, 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 I love this place, right? That's, that's how my first book ended. I just said, you know, look, this is my life. I don't want any other life. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, from a, I'm from a sort of people that are incredibly rooted, that are, uh, that are very communitarian and okay, I have to step out of that and cheat a little bit to be a writer because a writer by definition is egotistical, aren't they? they? They think they matter, they think their voice should be heard, they think they're the ones to tell a story. But that wasn't really what I grew up among. I grew up, um, I grew up in a community where you're not meant to stand out, you're not meant to be anything else. And I, I think there's a lot of good in that. I think we can all think of examples about how that might not be great if you're different in some way. Um, so one of my best friends when I was growing up was gay and it wasn't a good, it wasn't a good community to grow up in if you were gay. So it's not perfect. It's not, not sort of liberal, as liberal as I would like it to be or wasn't, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of good in traditional. I think there's a lot of good in traditional communities, that sense of looking after each other, that uh, of making sure you don't get too big for your boots and uh, of thinking of the whole, not just the individual. I, I like a lot of that. I, yeah. But I suppose what I mean as well is, I mean, you, you, you really do get down with the farm. I mean, you're, cast, you're, castrating, you're, you're castrating young rams and, and, and you're, doing all, you're, you're doing all the shearing and you're doing the mucking and you're doing, you know, you're up at the crazy hours, you're doing the lambing, you're, you're doing all this stuff. But you also find time to sort of stand back and look at the landscape of the Lake District and be moved by it. Yeah, and I, I don't know how new that is. My, my granddad did all of those physical things, of course, because he was a farmer. But I can very distinctly remember him uh, stopping and just sitting down and going out, like in his own words, how good does this valley look? How beautiful is that? How nice is that sunset? So I think there's, I think there's a myth that, that the poets had to teach people like me to think it was beautiful. I don't think that's true at all. I think people always knew it was beautiful. And... And I think I was talking to somebody one day about the stone circles. I think like Castle Rig stone circle, it's not very far from here. Uh, I think that some of the historians think that they were situated, not just for the sun, but because they were in beautiful settings. There was something about the aura of that place that was almost spiritual to those people thousands of years ago. And I, if that's true, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I think people have something in them about like that. And, and, I, and I love it. All those things you described as being hard, I just think they're real life. 
And I think one of the, like, I think that's what, if I'm honest, that's what I think real life is. You, you have to live in a place. You have to impact on a place. You, you have to eat. And the minute you have to eat, you have to change a place. Whether you want to or not, you change a place, right? Even to grow lettuce or lentils or whatever it is. And the minute you're changing a place, you're absolutely brought up against your own reality, aren't you? Sort of the realities of being you. And I, I think the modern world is amazing in all sorts of ways. It lets you do amazing things. It lets us all have these sort of freedoms that nobody in the past had. But it's also taking us away from some of those elemental realities. And I'm not sure that's good for us. So, so I want to ask you, James, if we just momentarily go back to those Maasai guys and women, yeah. the cycle of life there in, in rural Africa is incredibly evident and, and, it's, and it is very, very hard. I mean, you, I, I remember seeing a cheetah kill and it's, it's, you feel it's sort of almost voyeuristic. I guess it was voyeuristic. There's a cycle of life on your farm as well. And if I go back for a second to those, the compassion in world farming guys, I mean, they're not Bible bashers. They're not, they're not trying to sort of tell us that we must all become vegans, but they're trying to make life better for animals. You clearly do adhere to good practice. You care about the lives that the animals you farm lead. But you also, like me, eat meat. And I'm just curious where you stand on that, but both from an ethical and a sustainable perspective. I read a piece, as I told you earlier, in The Guardian, where you make everything that you talk about sound delicious, from the bacon and eggs that you have in the morning to whatever it is you're yeah. cooking at night, the steaks you make. Tell us where you stand so, on, on meat eating and what it's like to send your sheep to slaughter. So um, that's good. So the first, the first thing to be said about that is that most of what I do as a shepherd has nothing to do with death at all. So. Uh, most of my life is devoted to this ongoing flock of sheep. So the female sheep in the flock live for multiple years, many of them for 10, 12 years. Um, I just had two this morning, actually, that were looking too old to make it through the winter. So that sort of brings me to the heart of your question. So they've got too old to get through the winter. I have to decide what to do with them. I, can, I can't keep them forever like pets. That makes no sense financially. Uh, those two sheep have meant a great deal to me. They've bred some of the best lambs that we've had over the last three, four, five years. Um, but they will, and I will ultimately make the choice that they will go into the food chain in the next week. They'll end up in a curry or something in Bradford or Manchester or somewhere. That's what happens to them. What, where do I stand on eating meat? I, my ethics are quite simple. I think I haven't got a problem with eating meat at all. I've never heard an argument that convinces me for not eating meat. I, I, find, I respect other people's different opinion and, and to do what they do, but I... I don't think you can live or eat as a human being without killing things. I think death's part of the deal, if I'm really honest. I think being human is quite brutal. If you, had to, if you had to look in the face, look in the face of all the field where your food comes from, you'd see that it's absolutely, the whole process of eating is full of death. That's what it is. And yes, there may well be ways to eat in the future that doesn't involve, that involve less death, but um, it always fascinates me whenever you watch those Bear Grylls programs where he takes people to an island, people go on the island with a whole range of um, food ethical stances and as they get hungry about two weeks in they all start killing and eating pigs I mean it just happens in every single series um, I think that's what the reality is and if other people can want to do something different or believe doing something different makes sense good good for them I'm not here to convince anyone to eat meat do what you like it doesn't bother me um, but I I think we, I want to eat a lot of vegetables because it's healthy and it's good for you. Um, and we can produce more food in less space when we were producing plants on the best land. There's no doubt about it. But there's, there's nothing about my farming system that isn't sustainable or is incompatible with being highly biodiverse. And I can do it without any inputs, without any fossil fuels. So ethically, I believe it's right. I believe it's good. And, and, and I, I love meat. I'm not ashamed of that at all. How does, it, how does it feel when the sheep go? It feels sad, but then I'm very pragmatic about it. I don't, I think this is, this is what it is. And uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't trouble me deeply. At the turn of the last century, W.H. Hudson wrote a book called A Shepherd's Life. And I think that partly inspired your award winning book, The Shepherd's Life, which was also nominated for other prizes like the Indachi Prize and so on. I mean, it was a massive success and it propelled you almost to sort of household name status. 
And I think before we go to questions from the audience, and there are lots of them, I, I just want people to understand quite how remarkable your own story is, because you've already given us the indication, you already told us that your family had been farming in the area probably 600 years. You're very rooted in the land, but you're rooted in your, in your own ancestors as well, and the relationships that you described with your father and your, and your grandfather and, and, and others and so forth, and now the relationships you have with your own children. But you were a guy who was brought up in this sort of rural idyll, but that was tough, even if you say it isn't tough. And you appreciated the landscape. You didn't need poets to, to appreciate it on, on your behalf, as you've said. But you only got two GCSEs. And then somehow you managed to teach your own way into Oxford, went to Magdalen College with its own deer park and got a double first in history. And then almost as remarkable as that is the fact that you then didn't decide, although yes, you've worked with UNESCO and I think the World Bank, as we've talked about, you didn't decide to go and up sticks and live in Manchester or London or Birmingham and do some snazzy job. You decided to remain rooted in the land. So just in a couple of minutes, will you take us on that trajectory, both the before Oxford and after Oxford, and how you've ended up where you are now? <laughs> it took me 220 pages to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm that remarkable. Um, all right, I'm a bit weird. The writing bit's a bit weird, and the going to Oxford bit's a bit weird, but... Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't... I don't think I'm that weird. Anyway, um, what, what was the question? The question was, how do I take you on that journey? Okay, so, um, yeah, looking back across all of that stuff now, and most of the time I was doing things away from the farm or away from here, particularly going to Oxford, I didn't, part of me didn't want to go. Part of me, I went very reluctantly, and I always wanted to come home. I never, I've never really changed from being the sort of 13-year-old kid following my granddad around thinking living here was the coolest thing ever and that this is the most beautiful place ever and and wanting to be part of this community like that's who I was when I was 13 and that's who I still am it just I just had to go on a very long windy route to other places and doing other things to work out how to make enough money how to how to get back here how to how to write a book all that other stuff helped me to do that but um yeah the me, the me that works all day long outside trying to look after this place trying to get through it is it's not another species from the 13 year old me i think it's the same person it just we have to do what we have to do right we go we go on these sort of windy roads of our lives and they take us in funny directions you've got to just quickly tell us about the joy of writing as well james my, my bird book how to see birds which i hope after people have, have bought english pastoral will maybe consider my book as a christmas present as well it seems to bring people people joy or so i've been told but it was nearly published by a big publisher originally, and I got his notes, and he was quite enthusiastic. He said, when Matt tries to go lyrical, it doesn't quite work. Whereas you definitely are a lyrical writer, and I, I think you, you're probably at the very top of the, the tree, certainly the tree council's tree, when it, when it comes to ly lyrical writing about pastoral, pastoral Britain. You love a metaphor, just to explain to us how much fun you get from from writing and is there any, is there any relationship that that has with the sort of storytelling you do in your day-to-day -day life living the, the the farm hour by hour yeah yeah so um so th thank you for the nice words about my writing um yeah so when i when i remember back to my granddad being in the pub or whatever surrounded by his friends he could hold he could hold like that whole group of people around him he could make them laugh or he could he could almost make them cry with a sad story I, th I think there's loads of storytellers in loads of families, in loads of walks of life. I, so it, it does come from that, a lot of it. Um, and how much do I love writing? I, I'm, I absolutely adore being a writer. Ever since I fell in love with some of my favourite books when I was 17, um, and I was working on the farm, and then I started reading at nights and fell in love with reading and, and started to dream of being a writer. And some of my friends wanted to play football and I think it was like their dream they would play for Liverpool and maybe they would win the Champions League someday you know those dreams that all young men have my dream was to be a writer from the moment I fell in love with those great books and and un unlike my footballing friends who got to play for the local town and then it sort of doesn't quite happen for them or whatever I, I, I get to do exactly what I dream of doing which is quite remarkable I have to pinch myself really I'm, I'm 
it's a horrible cliche, but I am literally living my sort of dream of what I wanted to do with my life. So I'm very lucky. I have to say, I look at your life and I am I'm deeply envious because you managed to remain rooted in a beautiful part of the world, doing like real stuff and also getting to, to, to write and communicate that beauty to the rest of us. I want to throw in some questions to the order from the audience. They're all good questions. So if you could give them two or three sentences each and so we can get through all of them. Carol wants to know... Can so I, can, go on. Sorry, can I, can, can I just say, I get the most fantastic help from the Tree Council, Another Way and Oldswater CIC. If anybody wants to come up here and spend a day or a couple of days, get in touch with those uh, guys or girls. Uh, you can come up here and plant trees and all right, I'm not there every day. I'm sort of juggling other things, but I'll try and be there some of the time. And so if people want to come and help and want to see this place and be part of this, get in touch with maybe Emma at another way. Yeah, thank you. And if post pandemic, James, I would to, to say I'll come up and we'll do a bit of bird watching together. Who would be teaching whom most, do you think? Uh, How well do you I'm know sure your you bird? Do. I'm sure you'd teach me loads. I, I spend a lot of time looking at birds, but I, I'm not... But, I'm not particularly knowledge about the, knowledgeable about the rarer ones. So I'm the kind of bird watcher that could spend like an hour and a half lying on his back watching swallows over a meadow. They're not rare. I don't know a massive amount about them. I just enjoy the beauty of them or trying to work out what they're doing or whatever. So do you, do you we take could pleasure, swap those. Do you take pleasure in the, in the animal wildlife as well? I mean, badgers, foxes, do you get stoats and weasels and polecats and all these guys? Yeah, we, we do, all except polecats. I think there's been sightings of polecats not far from here, but I've never seen one, but we see all the rest of that. Yeah, and yeah, like my, my the things I see the most in my working life are the hares, or maybe here the most when I go to the building now will be the hares and the tawny owls. And probably my favorite thing I see is the barn owl down the valley or the, the barn owls, the several. And then this, this summer we had little egrets came back and I've never ever seen them on the farm before, but we built some ponds and they came. And we had green sandpipers and I love seeing the, the two years running, I've seen the osprey, the Bassenthwaite osprey coming over here when I've been lambing my sheep. And then I rang one of my friends, um, actually I didn't ring him, I texted him and I said, I've, I've just seen an osprey. And 45 minutes later, he rang me up and he said, it's the Bassenthwaite one, it's just landed on the nest for the first time. So I love that kind of thing. I'm like, I was out there, I'm very lucky to be out there. And then I see these things and it's, it's beautiful. You're making me very jealous. It reminds me as well, actually, a, a jumping off point that I missed at the beginning of our conversation. You said there was a picture of a curlew on your wall. And the curlews, mm -hmm. I think you've described in the past as, as, as declining. And that's one of the things that kind of made you realise that it's part of your role to, 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 to contribute to sustainability. Yeah, definitely. So there, um, I, th I think whatever you do on the land, there's or whatever you change from one thing to another, there's things fall off the edge of the table that can't cope with whatever you've changed it to. And uh, yeah, the, from the sort of 1950s landscape that my grandfather had known or created to the 1990s landscape that I was becoming an adult in, uh, yeah, that, there were things disappearing. And it was the curlews particularly that caught my eye because I, I, I just thought they were normal. And then they were suddenly vanishing. Everything you say and we talk about is a, is, is a jumping off point. So I will get to the Q&A very quickly. It just reminds me, I, about 10 years ago, I made a, a BBC documentary with the, the conservation director of the RSPB, a brilliant guy called Martin Harper. We went up to Bempton Cliffs, so east of you on the Yorkshire coast. And it's a wonderful place if people haven't, haven't been there. Incredible bird life there. And we went to visit a local farmer near there as part of the documentary. And he was... He was rewilding, I suppose, to an extent. He was creating little air patches of land for skylarks. And he was being incentivized to do that by the EU. So just in two sentences, are you someone who thinks that Brexit is going to be good or bad news for the British countryside and farmers? Or are you, or are you, or are you still undecided? Uh, no, I'm not undecided. I, I, I have loathed, if I'm really honest, I've loathed what has happened to the British countryside under the common agricultural policy of the EU. So I, I understood why farmers didn't like being part of that and thought we could have something better. Worse than that is a free trade deal with America at World Trade Organization rules. So, so, so if you're me and you're trying to work out what your ideal scenario is, it isn't either of those two things. Now that, that might be deeply naive, but it, there doesn't look like there's much hope there to me now. And the lesser of the two evils would be the European Union. But per frankly, if we have to have Brexit, then I would like there to be a Brexit with 
a policy which was the best that we could create for the British landscape. And, and I would pay quite a high price for that as a citizen. I, for example, I would not sign an American free trade deal and I would accept that food might be more expensive if we change the British landscape to make it more nature friendly. Um, that's, that's a big complicated subject, but yeah, the, the common right? agricultural policy. Yeah, most of the yeah. Carol says, is tree planting appropriate in the uplands or is hedge planting a better option? Uh, well, I, I, sorry, so there's a, there's a hierarchy, isn't there? The best kind of tree planting is natural regeneration as, as far as I understand it. Uh, the problem in a lot of the uplands is that because of that great, you need to do something because to limit the grazing or to exclude the grazing or to reseed the sort of scrubby stage that would start the succession to take off that would lead to trees. So what do I think we should do in the uplands? Uh, in a nutshell, I think lots of our landscapes, even the ones uh, where I care about the flocks of sheep, I think you, are, you need to create a patchwork around them. And that probably involves lots of fencing. I'd fence gills. I would have a patchwork of different management across the fells. Uh, I'm, I'm quite happy with planting masses of trees. So uh, the Woodland Trust told me recently there's a million trees been planted in the last five years in the English Lake District. So it's probably the most sustained significant shift for a very, very long time to have more trees. Is it enough? No, we can, we can do a lot more. We just need to think carefully about where things go and how we do it. I mentioned your, your neighboring farmers. Gareth says, are other farms and farmers around you doing similar things to you? Yeah, some, some of them are more, uh, have been doing this for longer than me and doing better things than me. Admittedly, some of them have bigger parcels of land and wilder parcels of land, but there's 20 or 30 farmers in this valley and the next. I would say a third of them are doing every, a lot of the things that I'm doing. Another third are, are on that journey, are trying to do the best they can, uh, which is where things like hedgerows become really important because uh, even a quite conservative farmer will let you sort of put new hedgerows around their fields or something that isn't too much of a shift uh, and then maybe a third of the farmers are very cynical they think we're we're not going to look after them in the long run and therefore they're going to have to look after themselves and have enormous amounts of sheep or be the biggest surviving farm so i, I understand their cynicism okay two two sentences no more for this one because it's a short but important question do the changes you've made asks anna to your farm mean that you can only support a smaller flock of sheep now no, that's the, that's the mind blowing thing. I actually have more sheep than my grandfather or my father had on this parcel of land. And it's because of that 30, by managing it differently, I can get this 30% uplift in the amount of grass that I can grow. And when I do, when I do mob graze, I'm just realized this might be Anna across the valley who's a friend of ours. Um, when I do graze, I actually need it to be heavy. If you look at um, places like the Serengeti and you look at how bison and wildebeest graze, they're, they are grazing very heavily and very intensely and then they're moving on. So there's quite a lot of evidence coming out of America that when you're doing mob, mob grazing with long recovery periods, it's actually okay to graze quite heavily. And here, here the issue is, can you construct a diverse enough landscape around the fields? And that's the more challenging bit. Well, we can do a lot of that as well. So and so Safika says sheep grazing and tree establishment do not appear to go together. How does that work? And you've just described that and answered that. Um, but Francis says, yeah, so, yeah. Right. Yeah, so, so how, how do you do that? Well, as, I, as I've said, you can do the sheep grazing or the cattle grazing bit fine, but there's got to be enough other places at the field edge or around the river or around the wetlands where you can let woodland happen. And we don't not graze those places, we just do different stuff. So we would graze them once or twice lightly with cattle. And this summer we've been putting woods in, sorry, pigs in there, some two saddleback pigs because basically in, the, in a wild wood, wild boar are the, the agents of dynamism. They're the ones that rough it up and allow their, so, so pigs are the secret there. So as with any of this, it's rarely about just leaving it alone now because the natural dynamism isn't there anymore. It's about the farmers learning how to do something that mimics nature. And that can be done with domestic livestock often. Francis says, is the farming that you're describing organic? And I think the answer to that is yes, right? And, 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 and yeah. anonymous attendee says, can you produce enough affordable food? And this harks back to what I was getting at a bit earlier. If all the farms in, the, in, 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 in Britain took up your methods, would, would we, how much would we lose or gain in terms of production? That's a good question. I think, I think the uplands can be more productive than they are now. 
I'm not, I'm not even joking. So most of our fells are mismanaged. And if, if they were properly managed with the kind of grazing I'm talking about, they would, they would rebuild soil, rebuild build soil health and potentially be more productive. But the bigger point is here, is that a large share of our food comes from our arable land, particularly in the south of England and in the flatter parts of Britain. That is where a lot of our food comes from. There's no point pretending it doesn't. So I'm not saying everyone should farm like me in any way, shape or form. I'm saying on a, on a farm like mine, this is what the solution looks like. On a lowland farm, uh, to get away from the kind of industrial chemical agriculture we've have it, had, we need to le relearn some old tricks so that it's mixed cropping, it's, uh, there's livestock back in the mix because that's what you control weeds with and rebuild fertility and have the pasture, the pasture stage. So it's, it's different answers for different places. Sorry, probably haven't got time to answer that properly, but we, we can, I think we can produce massive amounts of food in Britain with the kind of changes that regenerative farming does. Convince final, final two questions, James. Lucy says, how do you think more farmers can be persuaded to plant trees on their farms? Is it as simple as offering finan financial incentive or how does it, how does it work? Um, it's, it's, it's happening, but it's, a lot of this is about culture, right? If, you, um, if you're from a farming family, like many, up and, like many people like me are, then the thing that you get out of bed for in the morning is your, your love of your sheep, your pride in your flock, your dreaming of having the best sheep at the sales next autumn. You're not thinking about trees very much. So I think my story is probably instructive. Uh, people had to spend time with me to talk me through this stuff. People had to give me books to read that excited me that trees might be interesting. And there's, oh, I could, I could probably write a list of 100 little moments over 20 years where it shifts a little bit from what it was to what it becomes. Uh, so I think we need to think really, really carefully about, I hate calling it education, but I think it's partly education. It's, it's a sort of form of education where we take the knowledge of why trees are good into these families, into these communities, where that knowledge is not particularly strong and and yeah we need to think we need to think about the economics that those people are living with they're producing food at a quarter of the price it was 30 40 years ago that's a remarkable pressure to put on people and, and this last question from Jeannie sort of widens the scope of what you've just been saying from from farmers to, to us as a society she says how do we flip our British culture to look after our landscape environment and future local food production uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think, I think barely any of the politicians, right, let's keep this away from parties, I don't really care who people vote for, they're all as bad as each other at the moment. They don't, they don't think this, this will affect whether they win an election. They think, they, think cheap, they think cheap food is more important to people than nature, frankly. That's, that's, the, that's the gamble they're taking. So, uh, so what they're doing at the moment is that they're talking about nature without trying to address cheap food. And that's, that means you're gonna have some really good stuff happen in, in a limited number of places. But if you really, really want to have all of the things I dream of in the English countryside to make it way, way better, you need to think about the food, food economics part of this as well. And so what do we all do? We're gonna to have to make this really political. Not, maybe not really grumpy, but it just needs to feature really, really significantly in their thinking that they have to address this. Um, or they get voted out. I'm sorry. That, and we need to write letters to our MPs. So you need, we need to kill that American free trade deal dead. If you haven't already, write to your MP, lobby them, learn about it, read, read books by people that know about this stuff, and start being troublesome. Start being troublesome in restaurants and supermarkets. Start asking them questions. Where's this meat from? Did it come from a rainforest? If people, if people can't answer your questions, don't buy it. Final question from me, James. We're in the middle of a pandemic still, with any luck nudging towards the end of the pandemic. A lot of people struggling, a lot of people out of work, a lot of people finding it difficult to work. I don't want you so much to give a tip or tips to the rest of us, but could you tell us how you manage to make the most of life, to get the most out of it, to, to love and have a passion for what you do to the extent that you do, whether that's farming or, or writing? I, there's a quote of Milton's that I love. He said, and I'll probably mangle this, but he said something like, uh, the mind is its own place. It can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. And I think I've got one of those brains. So I, 
in a way I looked out, didn't I? In life's lottery, I looked out, I ended up in the most beautiful place. But I think if you dropped me as a kid, as a baby into somewhere far less romantic and ideal, I think I'd still be the person who thought it was the most beautiful pla per place around. Uh, I've, lived in, I've lived in cities and all sorts of places that were less beautiful than this. And wherever I live, I, I, I think it's, it sounds like a cliche, but it's about positive thinking, isn't it? It's about seeing the beauty in your own world. It's about, and, and I'm telling myself this as much as anybody listening, it's about seeing, valuing the little things, isn't it? The kindness of your neighbor, the, the decency of the people around you and looking for the good in people. I, 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 know, this, I know it's easy to get fed up with people and humans, uh, but I try very hard to, I don't get it always right, but try hard, hard to understand the world through other people's eyes and, and to try and see the good in them. I think it's too easy to give up on people. I think I give up on people and places. I think well, we need to, yeah. You're definitely an inspiration. And I'm so glad to have got the opportunity to talk to you. Your, your book, English Pastoral and Inheritance is available to buy. And, and I, I think it's such a brilliant title because it encapsulates the fact that this is an inheritance. We have inherited our landscape from all of our forefathers, not least of course yours. And it's something that we want to, con to, to continue to cherish and to be able to leave to those who come after us. And, and so to understand the landscapes that uh, have been bequeathed to us, I think is absolutely critical. And you're at the heart of that movement. Can I, can I just throw something else in as well? For anyone that doesn't know about me, the other, the other side of my family, my mum's side, were, there were cotton mill workers in Lancashire. And I used, to, I used to sort of slightly dismiss that side of my background really I, I thought I was just the farm kid and the farm bit of the family tree was all that mattered and I've come to realize that that's not true the I think one of the reasons that I value my life is that I know that my great-grandmother on the other side like worked in a cotton mill I've heard these stories that she was so poor that she had to pawn her Sunday best clothes so, and then get them back on the Saturday when she got her wages she scolded her front in a factory and had to cover it up so she didn't tell the foreman like I'm from that as well. I'm from the I'm from the grim industrial side of Britain as well. And yeah, it's all of ours. It's not just mine as some lucky privileged bloke who lives in the Lake District. It's it is yours, and it's my neighbours, and it's everybody listening to this, and it's the people that don't think they care about nature. It's it's all of our landscape, isn't it? And it, we we sometimes don't want to, but we need to think about it in that way. It's a collective inheritance. It's. And we need to somehow find a way to trust each other and work together and get stuff done. And that's, that's what's lovely in this valley. That's what's lovely about the Tree Council helping us and Emma across the valley. And it's just lovely. It's nice. And, and what I've tried to do, I suppose, is build on that, not specifically with your book in mind, but to build on this idea that nature matters and that there's beauty all around us. In my book, How to See Birds, I've tried to, to persuade people that there really is beauty on our doorstep, whether we live in inner city London or in a beauty spot such as yourself, you can go into your back garden, you can probably see, I mean, in my parents' back garden in London, I think I've probably over the decades seen 20, 25 species of bird, and we're about four stops from Oxford Circus, or my parents are. So there is great beauty all around us. You help to, to create and preserve that beauty, and we're all really grateful to you for doing that. E even though, as you say, this is all of our inheritance, and Jeannie just put another message up saying, quoting someone or other, I'm sure someone very famous saying that, we don't own the land, the land owns us. So James Rebanks, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm gonna hand us back to Sarah Lom of the Tree Council. I wanna thank Sarah as well for involving me and involving James and trees are very much, I think, at the heart of this inheritance and something I care passionately about and, and really hope that others will join James in planting thousands and thousands of them. So thank you to James, thank you to Sarah, thank you to all for listening and watching. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you, oh, thank, thank you. I, I want to thank you both for absolutely amazing conversation. It, and it warms my heart, James, to hear you talking about partnership because our motto is working together for the love of trees. And we've talked uh, this evening about uh, sea eagles and herdwick sheep and swallows and trees and hedgerows, which I think are the unsung heroes of the natural world. But, but you said something quite early on. Um, which in, certainly inspired me and which I hope will inspire everybody, which is you felt it was great. That everybody should put their best foot forward and be responsible for their own community for the future. And I hope 
that all the audience here, whether they live in the, the countryside or whether they live in the city, that we'll all be thinking about those words about being responsible for our own uh, communities and, and the wildlife in the cities as well as in the country. I just wanted to say again to everybody, you're both fantastic authors. You've, you've both got amazing books. Christmas is coming. Uh, you guys do pop these books in your own stocking or in, in the stockings of your loved ones. Uh, they would make really joyful Christmas presents. So do please uh, go, go and do that. And we also have an opportunity, uh, the Tree Council has a new Instagram account, and there is an opportunity on there to win a stack of books, including James's book and including Matthew's fantastic How to See Birds. Uh, so do take a look at the Instagram and have a go at the competition as well. But it really is time to say goodnight. I want to thank both James and Matthew for a, a, a truly wonderful evening. Again, thank you, our audience. And uh, this is the last event of National Tree Week. So have a very safe end of the evening. Enjoy the rest of the day. And thank you and good night. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.